being a psychologist and at the Lee Kuan Yew School of Public Policy, I'm considered a very different kind of species. When people talk about policy, I scratch my head and go, I'm not really sure what you're talking about. But uh, leadership is something I'm very interested in, and mental resilience is part of that. Um, we heard from Alan uh, the discussion of a static sense of self and how that can be corrosive, and how people instinctively try and elbow each other out of the way for their own happiness. And today I'm going to talk about a uh, corporate leader and his struggle with this as a means of describing what I think is some of the power behind using um, these ancient techniques of mental resilience, mental training, that come from uh, different, different, you know, all the major religions, uh, and dovetailing that with other systems such as psychotherapy and coaching. Um, mental resilience training has existed for hundreds if not thousands of years, but typically in a religious context. And uh, this is a time when we've, we needed, uh, we've certainly always needed resiliency training. Depression is sometimes a function of a lack of resiliency. And uh, in 2020, the World Health Organization believes that um, depression will be the second most debilitating disorder based on premature death and loss of pro productivity. Um, however, we're still very much in our infancy in how to treat these ills. And in case we think Singapore is somewhat immune, it was only a few years ago that it was described as a suicide capital based on its uh, rate of one suicide per day for our relatively small population. So I'd say this training is uh, not only important, it's urgent for us to consider. And with psychology and psychopharmacology being only partially successful, we're now looking for other techniques. We don't know who's going to respond to what psychological drug or, techn or, or technique, uh, to what extent and cures are relatively hard to come by. And we're also interested in how do you take people from normal levels of functioning to higher levels. In certain systems of psychology, it's regarded that unless you are enlightened or highly achieved, that you're basically mentally ill. And so there isn't that much distinction between those who we consider normal and those who we consider normally being sick. So the case I'd like to talk about spans the spectrum of pathology as well as high-functioning person. My earlier work at Stanford University was looking at taking uh, trance techniques such as hypnosis uh, and meditation to see could these help people in depression. I then became um, the primary psychologist for Harvard Business School and now I'm working with uh, leaders in Southeast Asia to see to what extent can these techniques be used for more high-functioning people, peak performers. And uh, the client, uh, I'll call him Harvey, He's a 40-year-old hedge fund manager who wields uh, multi-million dollar decisions on a fairly regular basis. He came in to see me after two years of depression and was hoping naively for some magic. Um, very standard psychotherapy, uh, cognitive behavioral therapy, produced remarkable results within a few months. In fact, I started to get concerned that he may go into a manic phase. He, his upswing was, was uh, very fast. And uh, that, that can be a concern too. We want to see progress, but at that speed, uh, it was a little alarming. He uh, became quite grandiose. His melancholy had become energy. His paranoia had become confidence. And there was a love interest that he was going to propose to her, and she would fall madly in love with him, and they would go off on vacation, live happily ever after, and the whole world would be bright. And that was absolutely fact, except it wasn't. And uh, he came crashing down with a horrible depression that lasted several months and uh, became severe. His concentration was ruined. His ability to handle an Excel spreadsheet was grossly compromised. And given the kind of work he was doing, this was really quite horrible. So he asked me, having initially come and made it clear that trance was not something he wanted to experience, he said to me, could you do some trance work? I'm feeling desperate. By that time, he was on medication. And we tried a number of techniques that didn't seem to move this very static sense of self that he had. It's the sense that I'm worthless, I'm unlovable, and this will never change. Um, I waited. I, want, I, I don't like using trance unless I feel confident that it's, there aren't going to be negative side effects. And one way of being more confident is if there's genuine enthusiasm for it. If there's a sense of reluctance of, oh, I should try that, I should try everything then my view is other techniques are more uh, amenable. 
So I frustrated him deliberately by waiting and pausing and acting like I was ambivalent. Uh, by about the fourth week, he was really very confident that we had to try this, and I felt that it was an appropriate means to try. Over the next two months, I taught him three techniques. One was basic breath awareness, a, a very simple meditation. Another was a, a hypnotic induction used to bring, um, for, for stress reduction, just calming of the mind. And the third was a little more elaborate. Uh, I had him visualize an idealized sense of himself. And for him, that was somebody who was confident, who was strong, who was charismatic, likable, kind. And when I asked him, eyes closed, in a, in, a, in a mild trance, to visualize that person, it was like a swashbuckling Indiana Jones who was really hip and good looking and powerful and didn't have to care what other people thought, but was charismatic and could, could galvanize a group. Well, the visualization seemed to have a very quick effect. Um, he became much more confident, and within about a month, a month and a half, he said to me, honestly, I don't see much difference between myself now and the idealized Harvey, uh, which was a bit of a concern. That his, there was a reality testing issue here. Um, he was pulling women in a way that he hadn't for many years. His work was going very well. His concentration had become very clear. He was doing the work that his mind was trained for. He was making plans within plans within plans. Very intricate, multi-million dollar plans and personally beneficial. He had been, and is, quite a philanthropist. But as his depression was leaving, the melancholia was now becoming vengeance. As opposed to thinking, I am intrinsically bad and I will never change. He started pointing the finger and going, that person is responsible for why I suffered. I'm going to get them. And these very, very intricate plans were being built to destroy small empires and to destroy the careers of people he had worked with. And he said to me himself, he said, I've become like Harvey Two-Face from Batman. Half of me this wonderful altruistic do-gooder, and half of me I just want to destroy. He ended that session by shaking my hand and saying, Dr. Marshall, thank you for all you've done for me. And I gotta say, I thought, oh my God, what have I done? <laughs> I felt like I had co-created just a monstrous capacity. His depression was still there as this darkness, but he no longer had the melancholy. He had the energy to actualize, really doing terrible things. And this is a very dangerous time in depression. It's when it starts to alleviate that people will often do things such as, which are more dramatically awful. We worked a bit more. I kept my fingers crossed, and in the guided visualizations, I started to temper with the image. He was, Im he was imagining himself as this powerful swashbuckler and started to forget the kindness associated with the image. So I would doctor it, saying, imagine the idealized Harvey as he's compassionate and kind, figuring that this was needed. I wasn't sure that I was being very successful, but what else to do? Uh, well, the financial crisis came, um, as did the rejection of a particularly important woman in his life. And uh, he, his depression returned. Not as crashingly awful as before, and, and he's in it right now. Um, there's a sense of stability to it. And in our most recent session, he spontaneously brought up the meditations and said, they are the thing which made the difference for me. And I know him quite well, so I played devil's advocate. I said, what do you mean? You came in depressed, you're depressed now. What's the difference? And he said, the difference is, I know this depression will end. I'm not as bad as I was before. And I have tasted a sense of what life can be. And it was only a few weeks ago I was there. And I said, well, you know, were you happy? You know, was this Harvey Two-Face thing giving you joy? I mean, because the meditation seemed to create Harvey Two-Face. And a real sense of sadness came. He said, I long to be Harvey Two-Face again. It gave me such a strength of solidity and power and, and self-righteousness that I long for. But he said, but the fact is, I can see now, actually, it didn't really bring me deep happiness. And he's looking to, for me to explain to him where he can get the deep happiness from, and he's not going to get it from me, unfortunately, because I, I don't know, but I'm working on it too. Um, <laughs> but uh, I asked him, I said, so do you really believe this stuff makes a difference? He said, absolutely. Now, he very rarely practiced on his own. We practiced in session. 
he said, on his flights to different nations to conduct these different negotiations, he would occasionally do the breath awareness exercise. And he said he would enter into negotiations more firm, more confident, and less hostile. He said there was a confidence he had that meant people knew he meant business, but it wasn't personal. So though he could be more firm and in some ways more threatening, he left with more respect and more liking from other people. So given how pragmatic this gentleman is, he's not into new age, fluffy, woo-woo stuff, that hearing from him the effect, I leave going, this stuff is powerful. It's not only powerful for those suffering from severe pathology and depression, where we have some empirical evidence of its efficacy. It is also powerful for people on the higher end of the spectrum. But I think where there are teething issues of how do we bridge in these different form of mind trainings so that people can benefit and that we can create something more integrated and tailored for individuals. So for me, that's where I feel that work is being done. And I feel that this is a very exciting time where we can take these ancient techniques and hopefully improve our lives generally. Thank you very much.